Voix 1, le TGV numéro 3635 à destination de Paris-Montparnasse va partir. Prenez garde à la fermeture automatique des portes. Attention au départ. On today's Join Us in France, the Mio Viaduct, the tallest bridge in the world and a truly stunning sight. This is Join Us in France, episode 146. Bonjour, I'm Annie, and today I bring you a conversation with Elise on the Mio Viaduct, the tallest bridge in the world, nestled to the east of our home region of Occitanie, and quite a sight to behold. My thanks today go to the three new listeners who signed up to support the show on Patreon this week. Bill Indrunk, Mary Kostopoulos, and Annie Gauthier. Much appreciated, Bill, Mary, and Annie. I take it there is some interest in the upcoming extended show notes, and I am very happy to see that. This week, the second week of April 2017, Patreon supporters should get both a new installment of Lunch Break French. That's the audio bit that I do in French to help you improve your French, and it's quite advanced uh, level French. And also get the first extended show notes. Thank you very much, Patreon supporters. I want you to know how much I appreciate your continued support. To support the show on Patreon, go to patreon.com forward slash join us. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. J-O-I-N-U-S. If you like this episode, you should check out episodes 105, Tips for Visiting Montpellier. Montpellier is just 100 kilometers away from the Mio Viaduct. And episode 107 on the best of set. And that's because Set is only 10 kilometers further uh, from the Mio Viaduct. They're all very close by. For show notes on this episode, go to joinusinfrance.com forward slash the number 146. At Join Us in France, we're all about helping you DIY your trip to France. But for those of you who want something special and something extra, Elise and I are putting on some tours. It's her job to do tours. It's my hobby. But hey, I'm learning. To learn about our most current tour offerings, visit addictedtofrance.com. Our first tour is going to be a week-long tour in Paris between May 14th and May 21st, 2017. That's coming up very quickly and I'm very excited and we're looking forward to meeting all of you there. The details about another tour, this second tour is going to be in the Southwest in September 2017. The, the details are all arranged. It's just a matter of me finding the time to create the page, uh, the sales page for that on addictedtofrance.com. But if you're eager to see that, check back addictedtofrance.com this week. It's coming. I'm working on it. <laughs> Thank you so much for your iTunes review, Jen Varen from the United States. Jen gives us five stars and says, quote, Excellent. I have been using this podcast to prepare my upcoming trip to Paris, and it has been so helpful. Definitely recommend. Close quote. Thanks, Jen. Reviews on iTunes are great and very helpful in helping the show gain, you know, credibility and visibility and reach iTunes is where most people go to search for podcasts on a specific topic. It's not the only podcast directory, but it's definitely the biggest one. And anywhere you can talk about the show around you is super helpful. Spring has come to France. It's going to be really hard for me to uh, stay at my computer this weekend to produce this show. But I'm going to do it. <laughs> 
what I really want to do is run out with my camera and take pictures of the flowers and the landscapes. It's getting so gorgeous, but I'll try to get away for a few hours anyway, as soon as I'm done editing this episode. If you want to connect with the Join Us in France community, go to Facebook and search for Join Us in France Closed Group. It's the most helpful group of Francophiles anywhere on the internet. You guys know your stuff. I know some things too, I, and I'm there as much as I can. So join the Join Us in France closed group on Facebook. This weekend is the Paris Marathon and we have two group members that are running it that I know of. Uh, so three cheers for Kaylee Spiney and Mike Shepard. Have fun, you guys. And take pictures and come back on the show to report because, as you know, I like to interview you when you have done something fun in France. I, I love to hear about it. All right, it's time for my conversation with Elise on the Mio Viaduct and all the other points of interest in the area, and there are many, as you will see. This is Join Us in France, episode 146. Hello, I'm Annie. And I'm Elise. And today we are talking about... Mio! <laughs> <laughs> and the... Viaduct. And the viaduct. The Mio Viaduct. The yes. engineering marvel. But first, but first, I'm going to let Elise talk about uh, the, the history and yes. all that. And so she can go to sleep for a while. And, no. uh, <laughs> and then, but notice how excited she is. This is nothing, this is not like when we were talking about Le Corbusier. And yeah. she was like going, oh God, do we really have to? Here, she's all, her eyes are all yeah, shiny I, and everything. I love the, the, yeah. this whole Viaduc de Mio. Yeah. I've been there. It's, it's so nice. It's really beautiful. Yeah, it's it is. Nice. It's, it's, uh, well, for those of you out there who have no idea what we're talking about. Um, yeah. So we're going to talk about, it's a town named Mio, which is actually interesting because I realized that I have been spelling it the Occitan way with an H. And ah, yes. there are two ways of spelling it. It's either M-I-L-L-A-U, which yes. is the French way. That's how I spell it. Or M-I-L-H-A-U, yes. which is the Occitan way. Yeah, that means you're a, a hick. <sighs> <laughs> no, it means that you come from the region because it's one of the. It, I this is all sweetheart. Stuff. I come from the region more than you do. Yeah, but you come from this region, <laughs> Toulouse. No, no, no. Okay, all right, everybody out there, take just listen, listen, because we're getting we're a little bit hyper here yeah. at this moment. <laughs> yes, yeah. uh, Mio is in the center of the department called Aveyron. Yep. It happens that it's the sixth largest in s department in France in terms of its uh, geographic size. Ge geographic size. Yes, it's a forty-five degree angle northeast of Toulouse, and that is it is two hundred kilometers away. Right. It because there's no main highway. It basically is about a two and a half hour ride to get there. Yeah, it's a long. It's a long, it's a long ride. Yeah. And it takes you into some of the most beautiful countryside in France. It and is that is lovely. coming from me, oh, saying yeah, that. It you is know. lovely. It is super gorgeous there. Oh, definitely a car place. I mean, you know. It's definitely it's a car place. kind of hard to visit that area. It's a rural France. area. It's, it's rural a, it's, and, and without a car, you're no, going to you, be hating you could, you could get transportation to the city or town if you want to call it of Mio but that's it you you know you really need yeah. a car but it's uh, the, the department of the Aveyron is actually considered to be a major agricultural uh, department in mm -hmm. France the biggest city is Rodez which yep. uh, is the uh, what the French would call the prefecture which means the county seat mm -hmm. really and Mio is the sous prefecture um, which the underling, which is the underling, 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 uh, and it's really the only other city in all of the Aveyron, and it's about a population of right now of twenty two thousand. Yeah. Okay. So it's because uh, the rest of it is really it's farmland, and it's also this fabulous thing that you have to like a certain kind of climate. I'm not big on tropics and wet and humid kind of stuff. I love dry i like limestone and so mio is in the center of a, a basically a geological basin mm -hmm. uh surrounded by what are called the coasts the coasts the coasts yes. the coasts and the coasts are basically limestone plateaus yeah it's the southern or southwestern tip of uh, massif central which is what the oldest huge mountain range in france 
it's kind of like the Appalachians in the sense that the mountains are so old that they've now been eroded down. Mm -hmm. And so they don't have like big points like the Alps right. and the Pyrenees. And so I'm not sure, I'm not a geologist, right? Uh, but but the, the coast is the part that apparently once is millions and millions and millions and millions of years ago was underwater, mm -hmm. uh, which is why it's all limestone, striated limestone filled with uh, caves and grottos, yeah. right? Yes. So a lot of these coasts uh, don't have a lot of really rich soil. Mm -hmm. So one of the major things that they have there is sheep. 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 So in your head, if you draw a line between Paris and Montpellier, yeah. you'll, as you get close to Montpellier, you'll hit Mignot. Right. It's kind of... Uh, in fact, I took a look just to make sure. It's 110 kilometers from Montpellier. Yeah. But because part of that is a bigger... Uh, road, it's only an hour uh, to get to Montpellier. It, well, yeah. Whereas it's two and a half hours to get there from to, here. Yes. From, from Toulouse. And I used to drive there all the time for basketball and uh -huh. <laughs> they're very good at basketball. Oh, why are they? Well, the girls are because um, they have nothing else to do. <laughs> have nothing. Yeah. She's laughing. She's laughing. Well, and, they yeah. beat us every time. Yeah. I mean, uh, oh, that, really? you know, it's, it's sour grapes, really. Yeah. <laughs> they were really pretty good. Yeah. But, but it is... Uh, <laughs> It's true. It's it's uh, it's not your big booming city. No, no. But it is truly one of the most gorgeous regions of France. Yeah. And this is not a region like the Loire Valley that's famous for huge, magnificent uh, uh, chateau. It's the land. It's nature. It's yeah. just absolutely gorgeous. A lot of hills. A lot of hills. Very green. Yeah. Even and then the coast. And then I've been there. I haven't been back in a while. You've been there more recently. But uh, the, the it's an area that has four seasons. Oh, so yeah. in the winter, it's it very cold. cold. Yeah, it can get cold. But to my great surprise, I was looking up all this interesting kind of uh, information. It's very, very, very sunny. It's It's got, uh, hmm. compared to Paris and a bunch of other places, it's got like three quarters of the year sun. That's nice. Except that it has wind. Uh. Yeah. But anyway... So in the middle of all this area, there is this town called Mio. Yes. Which has existed for forever and ever and ever because it actually was a settlement. This sounds like something out of Asterix. I just, you, you have to know, I just spent <laughs> a few days with a little boy who's five and a half reading Asterixes to him. So I was like, I've kind of got <laughs> Asterix on the brain at this point. Yeah, but grand baby does grand that. Grandbaby does that, right? Yeah. But um, it, it was a settlement of, for the Gaulois. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, And when the Romans, uh, in their wonderful going across and taking everything, you know, I mean, uh, this is what they were as very they good do, at, yes. it, as they did. Yeah. One of the reasons they wanted to go to this area was, believe it or not, not for the cheese and not for the sheep, but because even before 100 BC, this area was famous for a particular kind of ceramics. Ceramics, oh. And you can still go to the center. There's a center, actually, a historical museum. Oh, interesting. And it's called um, Gros Fanks. Gros Fanks. Yeah, let me see if I can G -O -S? spell it. G-O-S? G-A-U. Let me see if I'm pronouncing it right and if I'm spelling it right. I've seen ah, it. Okay, I've seen it and I have it written down here <laughs> somewhere. She's looking uh, through her papers. Well, Grofesank. 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 Spell, spell. G-R-A-U-F-E-S-E-N-Q-U-E. Grofesank. Grofesank. Yeah. Grofesank. Yeah. And when I was That doing... bizarre. Uh, and when I was doing my, my art history studies here at the university here in Toulouse... There was I did uh, several courses on you know uh, the ceramics. Roman the Roman no not on ceramics but on the Romans mm. and on and on the the archaeological digs and stuff like that and there's a huge amount of work that's still being done because it was a major if you can imagine two thousand years ago it was like a, the equivalent of a major industrial center mm. right in this area and this 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 pottery because that's obviously what it is. It's gorgeous, but it, it's a very specific kind. It's got this gorgeous red-brown glaze hmm. that sizzled. 
that is actually it has uh, it's carved into it. It's it's almost like raised tattooing uh, decorative little pieces oh. that that has been copied. Of course, now what they they still make the same thing. In fact, what you and I know as the kind of pottery that's used for making like cassoulet with that glaze, yeah, it's the same color. Okay, it comes from them. Okay. Except that now they don't do the beautiful decorative designs that they used to do on the outside. And when the when Julius Caesar saw this pottery, I'm googling it. He wanted to take the town because they wanted to and this is what they did. Uh they started exporting this particular ceramic all across the entire Roman Empire. Hmm. And they are still doing digs where they can find the places where they had the kilns and stuff like that. It oh, was it's a beautiful color. It's, it's a, a gorgeous red. color. It's just an, it's like like a burnt sienna kind of color. Yeah, it's just gorgeous. And so they would, and it's a special glaze. You know, it's very interesting. It's not this rough matte kind of pottery. It's just beautiful yeah, no, glaze. It's, it's nice. And it has all that like, I guess you would just call it. Like raised tattooing kind of thing, yeah, you know? yeah. It looks I mean, like it's little bumps, like little bumps, but yeah. with these beautiful designs. So it became famous. I, I'll put. I, I won't try to look for a photo to put on the website because I have way too many photos on the website. But I will write down the words, yeah, so you can and you can it look yourself. it up, yeah. 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 And so it became a really important commercial center under the Roman Empire, yeah. And then, of course, uh, like with almost everything, when the Roman Empire fire fell to all the barbarian hordes, you know, all these tribes yeah, and groups yeah. that came through. Uh, basically, they n- it didn't stop making the ceramics, but the uh, business basically ended, if you want to call it that, because there was no longer the possibility to export to the other parts of the empire and stuff like that. Mm. So I don't know what happened, to be very honest, between the end of the Roman Empire, which is about the year 400 AD, and the about the year 900. Mm. I had no idea. Okay. So we're skipping a few, a bunch of years. A few hundred years. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're just skipping a few hundred years. But, and then when we get finally (laughs) to really the beginning of, uh, the Frankish empire under good old Charlemagne. Yep. Um, who was the grandson of the very first Frankish king, you know, and he inherited basically pretty much all of France. Um, nice. And he revived the ceramic trade. Okay. He, he decided that it was really beautiful, even though his, you know, his homeland, his, his headquarters was in Aix-la-Chapelle. He was basically in what we now know as Germany, but he traveled all over the empire. And he was, he was like the French kings that came afterwards. He never stopped traveling. Aix-la-Chapelle is in Germany? Yeah, it's Aachen. Aix-la-Chapelle oh. is Aachen. Aachen. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah. And so he came through uh, Mio, and um, when he said, well, we have to do something to help revive this trade because uh, it was a very lucrative trade. And it was at the same time that in the outskirts of the area, because this is really, you know, it, it is really in the bottom of what in French would be called a cuvette. So you have the, 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 the basin, the, the low mountains all the way around it. And there are two, two rivers that crisscross right there. That's the Tarn and the, the Duby. They started building monasteries in the area. And of course, monasteries were very uh, entrepreneurial. You know, and they either produced mm-hmm. wine or cheese or ceramics Something. or this. They always traded. You know, they were very yeah. big commercial centers. So what happened was that from that point on and all through the Middle Ages, Mio became famous for being a commercial center again. Okay. Uh, it's hard for, I mean, you and I have driven there. It's hard to imagine that this was a major stop on trade routes a thousand years ago because it's really in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Well, it's in the middle of today's nowhere. It's today's nowhere, right? Because, and that's mostly because the going from uh, west to east in France at that height is really hard. It's really hard, yeah, right? And and it happens again in the Pyrenees. As right. you get lower, if you want to go, you know, west to east or east to west, oh goodness. It's, it's really hard. You have to go north and down exactly, and, and right. it's yeah, it's so a mess. My guess is because I know that there was a lot of activity with Montpellier and, and the, the coast that that was probably one of the major venues. That was probably how mm-hmm. most of the people circulated and then out there going towards Rodez again. But you know what? If you're traveling in a like a, a caravan uh, 
a car- no, yes, not sort a caravan, of cart but with, cart with, 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 yeah. with oxen or right, horses. Right. Well, then, They're, yeah, I can see how it could be in the, right. you know, in the center of the... Probably. And then, yeah. of course, the Romans always had roads that they, they left, whatever, you know, I mean, even if they well, were just they made of big stones. Up, yeah, they weren't, weren't going to pick up, up their the, stones. Yeah. No, you're right. This isn't Asterix. <laughs> and it's starting, and then starting in the Middle Ages, because of all these sheep, meh, meh, yeah. Um, something else developed as a very important industry that Mm -hmm. still exists there, and that is the leather trade. Mm. And the name Mio has come to be associated, actually, in the last five, six hundred years with the finest leather imaginable, made, of course, from sheep's skin, uh, sheep's skin leather. And starting in the 1400s, it became the center for the producing for all of Western Europe, which is unbelievable, of yeah. gloves. Oh. Fine, soft leather gloves. Lovely. The royalty from every country wanted them, and, and then it just became the thing that mm. everyone would trade. And so because it became such an important center, they were, the, the people of Mio were given the right to have four major, what they called at the time, the foires. Yeah, um, which were very important. You had to have a royal well, it's like a convention, it's a like royal a, seal giving you yeah. the right to have it, right? Because I guess they got twenty five percent off the top or something like that. Yeah, you yeah. Know? So those were like major um, agricultural trades and trades conventions, like a, like a, a way. big fair. Like yeah, a big if you fair, could imagine yes. a county fair, but that includes fine products, you know, not just animals, but like fine cloth and spices. And people would come from literally, you know, northern Italy and further east and all yeah. over because it was yeah. the moment, maybe three or four times a year, that you could have a chance to do all this trade. Right, right. And so that really is what put Mio on the map. Nice. And it actually, it's interesting because it became a part of the Kingdom of France officially in the year 1271 which is when all of this area did, which is part of the whole history of Toulouse and the Counts of Toulouse. Mm-hmm. Before that, it was kind of like, it was belonged to the King of Aragon, it belonged to the Counts of Provence, it belonged to this one, it belonged to that one. But basically, it was its own thing. It had its own, they were given a charter because it was such an important commercial center that they could make their own laws, which of course is what all of these little cities wanted because then their local city council could make the taxes and of course we all know that everything runs on taxes no matter what, right? <laughs> I mean, that's let's face it, that's what makes the world go around, yes, right? Yes, yes. So uh, believe it or not, in the 1500s, there were almost 6,000 people in Mio, which is fairly big. Yeah, 6,000. Yeah. It's, it's not that it's much 22, more. It's 22,000 now. now. okay. But that right. was, considering that that was 500 years ago, that was a lot of people. And then, uh, and this is part of the history of the region, which is why it's kind of interesting. For reasons that I could not begin to explain, it became one of the most important centers for the new Protestant religion. Mm. The Huguenot religion, you know, uh, mm-hmm. basically the Protestant religion, the, what the French call the Reformed Church. And for over 100 years was the center of uh, all Protestant writing and thinking and everything else. Actually, Montpellier was close by and was part of that too. But the whole region around there, including parts of what are called the Cévennes, which is yep. part of the region to the to the north and east uh, of Mio. It became the most Protestant part of France. Mm. Uh, And so a lot of people went there when they were persecuted elsewhere, which is another reason why it became very popular as as a place to live. And then with the War of Religions, what happened was, and this is of course true in almost every part of France anyway, uh, people either converted or they left. Okay, all right. Uh, That's why the Huguenots went to the... United States. That's why they went to South Africa. That's why they went to Holland. That's why they went to England, because it was life was hard for them after mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and and it's interesting because uh, I've been through parts of that area with part of my uh, my in law family who are descendants of Huguenots, and um, it's an important area for them. It's really interesting when you drive through that. Aside from the historical buildings or whatever the nature has, people have a specific relationship to, to that area because of that. The, the heritage of that is that in World War II, it was one of the most important centers of, f- of really 
organized resistance hmm. to the occupation of, hmm. by the Germans. Um, very proud of that kind of heritage of resistance to, you know, that kind of thing of being very individualistic and, right, and, and right. very organized and everything else. So it turns out that with all of the um, ups and downs of a place like that, today the leather trade still exists, even though it's certainly not as important in terms of the economic situation of the country as it used to be. Right. But believe it or not, it still turns out 800 thousand pair of fine leather gloves a year mm. and they are considered to be among the finest leather gloves you can possibly have anywhere from this how many did you say eight hundred thousand pair Oof. eight hundred thousand pair high-end wow high-end gloves soft beautiful leather gloves and you can go when you go to the old city center which is very small Going to visit Mio, of course, and I know you're going to talk about the things, part of what's going on around it, but the, the town itself is really small. Yeah. It's charming, but it's really small. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, but it's got a couple of very nice little tiny museums, one about the Museum of the History of the Region, one about the history of leather making. It has some very beautiful little shops that sell all of the leather products. Uh, besides, you know, the other things, you know, foodstuffs and everything else. Um, it has a little bit of medieval structure left inside it. It doesn't have too much. But what it still has, interestingly enough, is four major night markets in the summer. Mm. And and uh, it's a big deal, apparently, that uh, I don't know if it's, I don't honestly don't know if it just means one night or if it's several nights in a row. But, but scattered across the months of the summertime, uh, these are markets that include selling everything that you would find on a normal, typical market, right. plus music, plus food, you know, people dance and people do, walk, nice. you know, so it's really like festival time. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And, uh, Sounds fun. And it's really nice. And yeah. so, and of course, it's, it's, uh, it's not that easy a place to get to. You can get to it by public transportation, by train and by bus. But uh, as you said, it's much, much easier to actually oh, yeah. go by car. And one of the things that uh, you have, of course, you have various things that are produced in the area. But also nearby, uh, you have some very beautiful medieval monasteries to visit. You have other things like that. And then you have, of course... Um, the famous Roquefort cheese. Exactly. Roquefort. Roquefort. The cheese place. The, the cheese. So this is, a, this, is, this is a detail that you need to pay attention to, folks, because there's several Roquefort yes. in France. Yes. The one you want is Roquefort sur Soulzon. 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 Exactly. Uh, that one is in the Aveyron. The other one is a uh, town in... Um, um, the Lot et Garonne, called which, Roquefort, ah. which has nothing to do with the cheese. Well, it has nothing to do with the cheese. So you want to go to uh, Roquefort sur so Soulzon. The zip code is 12250. Right. That's the one you want. Right. Yeah. And, and so here's the story about Charlemagne. You have been warned. You've been warned. If you set your GPS to the wrong Roquefort, <laughs> oh, God. don't hate me for it. Boom. I have told you. <laughs> no, she'll come after you, so you better watch out, you know. So, <laughs> so the town of Roquefort, I've actually... Have you ever visited the... Yes. So have I. Okay. Yes. Which one of you... Did you go to Papillon or did you go to Societe? Do you remember? <laughs> okay. Everybody out there. There are lots of different brands of Roquefort cheese. There I are two or three things that you need to know. In France now, and it's been legislated since the 1800s, for a cheese to be called Roquefort, it has to be produced in the town of Roquefort, Sur Soulzon, mm -hmm. with raw sheep's milk that's yeah. of course collected from the various farms in the, in oh, the really? in the yeah, area, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and of course the whole point of this cheese is that it's a blue cheese mm -hmm. that's uh, that's produced and it's led to uh, I guess ripen is the right word yeah. in in underground caves in the limestone caves, yeah. and it's or, the or I mean, by now they can reproduce the conditions of caves. Well, they do, but but they do. But that, they still use. This the is caves. where they still use the yes, caves, yes, and of yes. course the, the the now they actually do inject uh, the 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 penicillium, you know, in, yeah. into it. But of course, it was that the story is the apocryphal story is that it was some 
some far from some sheep herder who who uh, left his piece of uh, cheese and piece of bread on piece of rye bread on top of the cheese in one of these caves went out chasing some girl and then uh, came back. I don't know if it was hours or a couple of days oh, later. It took a week. Uh, it took a week. When you oh boy, he had a good girls. time. Okay, <laughs> he, he must have had a really good time. And when he came back. The the um the mold from the bread had seeped into the cheese and it was this strange bluish green. And behold. And behold. <laughs> but so this is the this is the other story. This is the, the Charlemagne story. So Charlemagne, here's emperor of basically Western Europe, right? Yeah. And this is what are we in? The eight hundred something or other? I don't even remember it. Anyway, he's traveling around looking at his domain and he's going from town to town. And uh, he stops in, uh, whether he stopped in Mio or Rocafort, I really don't know. But he stops in the, in the neighborhood. Yeah. And, uh, of course, they serve him some food, but they don't have a lot of food because it's um, Lent. Ah. And he can't have meat. Ah. And he's very, very religious, so no meat, and there's no fish because we're not near the water. And he showed up at the last minute. He should have called ahead of time, but he didn't, right? <laughs> you know? So he shows up, and of course, he's the emperor, so, oh my God, we better find something to give him. So and nice, so, of yeah. course, they give him some wine, and they give him some bread, and they give him some cheese. And when he sees this cheese, and he sees this, like, bluish-green <laughs> whatever and he takes his knife and he starts picking it all out you know and thinking oh my god on top of which all these these are my subjects and they're giving me rotten cheese you know like they're really trying to get rid of me i'm sure he wasn't quite that nice about it uh and until somebody probably somebody that was uh important enough for him to actually listen to said to him sire you know i could just see this you know yes, yes, sire, sire please yes. sire um uh, no don't take that blue green out it is actually what is giving the cheese its a special taste it is uh, it's delicious it is what is called in french persillé which means it's, yes. it's i don't even know how you translate that into english well. Parsley, parsley. You know, it's it's veined, it's veined with you yes, know this. Yes. And so he said, "Oh, okay." And then he took a taste and went, "Whoa, this is super!" And asked for he them loved it. to send him. Um, it's made into wheels. You know, the, this is a cheese that's made into wheels. And he said to them, uh, "I would like to have some of this delivered to my my palace in in Aix la Chapelle." And they said to him, we don't really think it will work. We don't it, deliver? It, we don't deliver. It's no. not a cheese that <laughs> travels really well. And he said to them, "It's just, this is really interesting because I really wonder if this is really true about the cheese itself. Um, he said, take the wheels and cut them in two horizontally and pack them in uh, wood with a, th a thin linen cloth, in, you know, between the, the, the wood and the cheese. And uh, that should work as a way of putting it on a wagon. And I don't know how, maybe it took a week or two to get to Aix la Chapelle. I don't see how cutting it horizontally. I don't know what that would do. Difference. Neither do I, to be honest. But yeah, whatever. Anyway, so they, they, he, he, he got a whole lot of uh, Roquefort cheese sent to him. Sent to him. And it became basically the most prestigious cheese. And this is going back to the 800s. Oh, it's pretty good. I it's, mean, and of course, you know, I mean, really I'm sure stuff. there are people out there who... Who can't stand it. Can't stand it, don't like it. It's a strong flavor, but it's oh, very it's strong. so good. It's very strong. It's rather salty. Very. Right? Oh, it's terrible for your health. It's terrible for It'll your health. Kill you. Well, actually, I... You know what? Go on the site because I did this this morning. I was really amazed because aside from the salt, it's filled with minerals and vitamins and all kinds of other stuff. So if you eat it in well, small course, quantities, it's cheese, really good for you. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I, I mean, I have it. I, there's hardly a week that goes by when I don't buy some. So obviously. No, there are other blue cheeses. And actually, yeah, there are oh, yeah. two others that also come from the Aveyron. One is the Blue d'Aveyron. The Blue d'Aveyron. But they're from... But they're cow cheeses yes and this is the only one that has to be sheep uh, raw milk sheep's cheese it's yeah. very it's very 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 well, they carefully probably controlled. make some that's pasteurized because they sell it in america no no and in fact you are so good because you bring me to the last thing i want you to talk about before you start talking about the viaduct in 1999 there was a huge scandal about something that happened in the town of mio because 
of the problem with trying to export Roquefort to the United States yeah. and because of the rules and regulations about food in Europe and the difference with the trade agreements with the United States. And so someone who I bet you don't like at all, I have very mixed feelings about him, named Jose, Jose Bove. Okay. Uh, who was and is... I will reserve your judgment. Yes. No, he, um, he is actually now a representative of France in the European Parliament, okay? Yeah. This he, is where we send all the crazies. Not always, just crazies, but he, he, yeah. he, he, was, he is a farmer. I mean, uh, uh, he, he, yeah, yeah. he raises sheep for milk for, for cheese, okay? Mm -hmm. He was someone who had actually been an academic who had left uh, that life to go live on the coast and, and be, you know, organic and, and all this kind of stuff. And what happened was... That in 1999, there was a very big problem with trade agreements about food between the United States and France because the United States had said that, for, I don't know exactly why, there, something had happened, and they said that uh, they would no longer accept Roquefort cheese because it's made from raw milk, and uh, that the only way they would accept it is if the European community, which means not just France, but the entire European community, would accept to import American beef that is filled with growth hormones. And the European community had said no, that they would not. They refused to have American beef, which is, uh, unless it's organic, which of course was not what they were trying to sell. They were trying to sell the masses of, you know, the beef that is produced in the United States. And so there was this huge problem. And what happened was because of that, they said that if they didn't accept to the beef, that they would put a 35% tax on the Roquefort, which meant that a lot of these uh, sheep farmers would have their businesses killed. Yeah. And so what they did was, and this, is, of course, is where we get into the difference between the French and, and, and Americans. Beauvais and a group of his uh, friends who were organized because the farmers in France are organized into actually the equivalent of unions. They went to downtown Mio and uh, in the process in downtown Mio, which really is tiny, uh, in 1999, so this is 17, 18 years ago, they were in the process of building and finishing the very first McDonald's in uh, the city <laughs> center. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, well, you weren't living here at the time, see, no. and I, I was, so I remember this very clearly. Yeah. And Beauvais and his friends trashed the, the, the building. They trashed the McDonald's. They trashed the McDonald's, yeah. They actually trashed it. Um, and, oh, wow. and they did it... Um, and it was a big media thing. I mean, it was just, it was a huge media thing. And they were, of course, on television for days. And he became a very important spokesperson for uh, all of the, uh, the people in agriculture who were really having a hard time, you know, getting, making a decent living. Yeah. He was condemned to, to um, three months uh, of prison firm, uh, you know, prison. Prison firm. Firm. Yeah. I don't know. So actual uh, jail. Actual, actual jail. Yeah. And, um, and then... Um, and then suspended, and then, of course, they had to pay a huge fine. But what he accomplished by doing that was that he made uh, the cause really, really well known, so much so uh, that uh, a lot of people rallied to it because uh, what he said was, and I'm not uh, in no way con uh, condoning uh, what he actually did to the, the McDonald's building, but what he said, which, of course, was absolutely true, was that... Uh, in France, like in other European countries, there is a very long heritage of eating certain things that in no way are bad for your health. And that uh, if the only way that they can make money by exporting these products to a country like the United States is to accept uh, beef that has hormones in it that are really bad for your health and uh, other crops that have been uh, modified and whatever, uh, that they're not going to do it. And so what happened was that a, really it became something that became a cause célèbre afterwards. Mm. And it wasn't until uh, Obama became president that uh, the whole thing was resolved because Obama uh, convinced Congress to allow the Roquefort with raw milk to be allowed into the United States and that they would, in exchange, that Europe would accept organic beef from the United States, but not the beef with growth yeah, okay. hormones. Okay, 
interesting because uh, at Costco you can totally buy Société Roquefort. Right. And it's the real thing. It's the real thing yeah. with raw milk. But uh, yeah. imagine so if that there was a couple of years where there was no buying Roquefort in the United States because huh. of that. You know? Now, in, in, at Roquefort, they have a société, they have Papillon, Papillon and they, they have, have all, all these others. sorts. Right. Some of them are very, very small producers. Yes, yes. And there's one, I can't remember the, the name of it even. Uh, it was some, I think it was called Fermier something. Yes. And it tasted so good. Yes. I can't even find it in Toulouse. Well, I, the, only if you go to a specialty cheese store. In fact, it's it's really fascinating because I got so into this whole thing. I, uh, there's a list when you go onto the site about the cheese. They list the different labels of the different brands. It turns out that uh, Societe and Regal and a whole bunch of others are owned by this huge, huge mega corporation, Lactilis. Okay. Which is a huge megalith, mega, mega, mega yeah, big uh, into, business, uh, yeah, big business thing. Uh, and then the second group, which is Papillon, is owned by another so, uh, indus- industrial society, but is much smaller. And all of those, of course, are made in an industrial way. But then you have two or three producers of Roquefort that do it the fermier way. Yeah. And they, of course, don't produce nearly as much. But right, if can. you ever get to taste one of those, it's yeah, just sublime. Yeah, they taste really good. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They, they, you can really tell the difference. But the fun thing is, is going on a tour either I know that for yeah. sure Societe and Papillon have these tours yes. all the time and they have them I, in English you I know. think we went to Societe but I'm not certain I don't remember which one ago. yeah doesn't and, really matter and they give you the history and they take you down below where you see these zillions and mm-hmm. zillions of wheels of, of Roquefort and they tell the story of, and it smells a little and, bit you know, it's a cheese thing and then of course it's really fun to buy some yeah right you can there. buy some yeah. and you, they will give you some to sample and so this is this is basically the area of the center of of the region called Aveyron yeah, yeah. and the Mio and the other part of it, which is what you are going to now talk yes. about, which is this fabulous thing. Is the viaduct. Is the viaduct. So the viaduct is not that old, but it's been there for a few years. I can't remember the 2004. year. 2004. 2004. Which seems, I thought it was newer than that, actually. Yeah. It seems like yesterday. It's been a while. It's two and a half kilometers long. Which is huge. It's th- 32 meters large. It has four lanes, well, two lanes of traffic in each direction, plus um, the emergency pull-off. Um, the The way they built this, imagine that you build several Eiffel Towers in a row. Like you, you build like six of them in a row. Yeah. And then you put a road across them. And that road takes you from one side of the Tarn um, Gorge right. to the other side. To the other. It's a very deep, very deep gorge at that spot. Very deep. And so they, uh, they used to have a road that goes from Paris to Béziers. And that's the A75 freeway which has been there forever. And it's one of these, between Clermont-Ferrand and Béziers, that road is free. Okay. Because free, uh, freeways in France are actually toll roads. They're turnpikes, yeah. Yeah, they're, right. they're toll roads. But they're usually toll roads on concession. Yeah. And once the concession is over, it, re- it turns back to the government property and the government doesn't charge. So they will... You know, they will maintain the road, but there's no more tolls. Because that road was free most of the way, anytime anybody from Paris wanted to go to the south, they would go that way instead of the other way, which you still had to pay for. Right. And so that created giant, giant uh, traffic jams at Millau because everybody at Millau had to get off of the freeway through the city of Millau back on the freeway to get to the other side. To the, get to the other side. To get to the other side. And it's, it was just a nightmare. The other question I have to answer right away is, is it a viaduct or is it a bridge? What's the difference? Well, the difference... Okay, so viaduct comes from Latin, and it means path, it's path and ductus, right? So it's like to lead or drive. So a viaduct is a path that drives something over a valley and, or a river, right? Yeah. The Pont du Gard, which we talked about in episode 65, 
is one of these viaducts. Uh, Mio Viaduct leads cars, but mm. it's still, uh, you know, if we don't want to get too tangled in knots, the uh, the Vio Viaduct is both a viaduct and a bridge. Is it a bridge if it's over water and this is over land? Is no, that the difference? No, it, it has nothing to do. No? it has nothing to do with that. It's yeah. The definition of the word bridge is just more general. Oh, a viaduct is over uh, a path over a big, a big gap. Deeper, a big yeah. deep. Yeah, yeah. Huh. So I think that's that's what it is. Huh. Now let's talk about a few common types of bridges without getting too technical because I'm not an architect. Uh, you have some bridges are supported by two or more piers. Right. Right. And they were always thought they were called pylons. Right. They're not. They're called piers. 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 Oh. Yeah. Uh, there are bridges that are subsen- subsen- uh, suspended. Right. <laughs> right. On cables. Right. And these, angle- and these cables are anchored on the edges right. of the bridge, right? And so the weight of the bridge rests on those cables. Right. So, uh, one, a beautiful example of that is the Golden Gate Bridge exactly. in San Francisco, right. right? A third type of bridge is called the Cable Stayed Bridge. And that's what the Mio Viaduct is. In this type of construction, they use both piers and cables, mm. okay? And... Mio has both the longest deck. Uh, the deck is the the road right, that goes over right. these piers, and the and so it has the longest deck and the tallest piers huh. in the world. Uh, in the world. In the world. Wow. To this day, yes. The so the surface on which cars drive is called the deck, right? Right. In French, it's tablier. Right. But, uh, uh, and the whole point of a bridge is to support that deck, right? right? right. That's right. So, the problem they were trying to solve, like I said, was to get to the south, well, get north and south, and the project to solve, to solve this started in 1988, so a long time ago. At the beginning, lots of locals were against it because they thought it would be unsightly, it would be expensive, it would disturb birds, uh, including a specific type of bird that's a uh, nest in this area called the little bustard. Local politicians, uh, they fought over where the road would go. Because anytime there's money that comes into right. a project like this, people start fighting about yep. where it's going to go, right. you know, specifically. Um, there were other cities with big interests. Uh, Roquefort is one of them. Saint-Afrique is also another city nearby that would have liked to have this kind of, that kind of traffic. But there were also lots of people in favor, even locally, people who really recognized that lots of visitors would come and see this thing, which is exactly what's happening. Which is what's happening. Lots of people go see this thing. I I think, if I remember correctly, that the, the, the division in terms of people's ideas or attitudes towards it was that there were those who were afraid that if the traffic stopped going through Mio, that the commerce would all die because they would bypass the old city center. Exactly. And then there were those who more optimistically said, no, it will bring tourism into the area. And that's exactly what, and that is of course, that's what, luckily for them, it it is really what has happened. So the, the, the biggest problem that they had to, uh, to confront is the wind in this area Mm -hmm. because there can be wicked strong winds right. at time. Uh, but, I mean, that's like hurricane force winds. Yeah. It has to be super yeah. strong. And but I, it, they and, can happen. And it is. I mean, and it's really high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really yeah, is. Yeah. 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 So the, the authorities studied the project for 17 years before the construction started. It took three years just to, sh- just to choose where the viaduct would be placed. They chose an area that was that's a little bit west of the city of Millau. Right. Then for five years, they ran calculations on uh, to choose the type of viaduct that they would implement. Then they had to choose how to finance this uh, this monumental project and find the right builder. Right. The financing was going to be done with public money, so taxes, yeah. uh, but. This took so long to implement that governments changed several times, you know, uh-huh. while they were talking about it. 
And the government that was in place when they were ready to actually start signing some checks was led by Jospin. So it was a socialist government. And they decided, strangely, to make this a concession project. So Run by a private company. Then. Run by a private company. So it's actually taxpayer money did not fund this. Huh. See? Which is kind of funny. Socialists, they get into power and then they... Well, they in on. a way, it's <laughs> keeping... That meant that the people didn't have to pay more money in their taxes. Right. But they must get a cut out of this. Oh, yes, they do. They, they absolutely do. So the, the private company that they selected to do the building is Effage, which is a, a huge construction yeah. company. They also built the channel. Oh, they are the ones who built the yes, channel, huh? Yes, yes. Wow. And the the concession that they were awarded is for 78 years. Hmm. An odd number of years. Yeah. So Ifaj gets to collect the, the fees for 78 years, and then it reverts back to the French taxpayers. To, the, to French taxpayers. Who will then incur the cost. Because it costs to go across it, right? Yes, it does cost to go across. I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, so there were five engineering and architectural firms presented that presented projects to Efage, because Efage is just a builder, right? Right. Um, and the winner for this project was Norman Foster. Ah, it was Norman Foster. Yes, who and, I know as a great architect. Uh, there you go. Uh, so he was the English architect. Right. He became a lord in 1990. So I guess I should call him. He's the one that Lord. did the building that's like this in London. Yes, the <laughs> I'm not going to say it. You can. Oh come on! It looks like genitals. No, Male. they call it the suppository. Actually, oh suppository. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. It would He's be very famous, actually, as funky an architect. Shape. Yeah. Anyway, this man's origins were very modest to begin with. I'll just tell you a two-second summary of his life. Let's see. He also did the Hong Kong airport. Camp Nou in Barcelona, so the soccer stadium in Barcelona. And his name is not known. I mean, you know him. Oh, I know him. He's very famous in architecture. In architecture, oh, he's, yeah, he's famous. He's very, very but famous. For, for somebody like me, who's like a, not that well-informed about architecture, you know. Oh, yeah. He's, yeah. Been, he's one of the biggies. Yeah. Um, he's fabulous, fabulously rich. Well, certainly now. <laughs> he likes to fly his own jets and helicopters. Oh, that's not interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. The... the Structural engineer uh, for the Mio Viaduct was is somebody called Michel Virge, Virlogeux, French person, and they decided to not build the aqueduct in a straight line. Huh. it's slightly curved. Really, the reason for that choice is the that wind. They d no, they didn't want to overwhelm the drivers and make them nervous. Because if you can see in a straight line uh, and you're on this massive bridge, they feared that people would try to speed up and oh, would wow. panic almost. Well, that's really interesting. Whereas the way it curves, you never really see the end. Huh. You, you, you just know you're on this road and you see the predictable piers, the, the piers and the cables right. and that, but you don't, visually, you don't see the end. Huh. I guess people say that it almost feels like flying without any, any, you know. We, we, I didn't go on to it, but when we went to visit the uh, Mio, we went, there's a spot now, and it was created, I guess, very soon afterwards, um, where you can approach uh, from underneath oh, yeah. on one side, and yeah. it's specifically for people to be able to see it. Yeah, and there's I a mean, visitor it, center. It, it's really like a hallucination. Yeah. I mean, this thing is unbelievable. First of all, it's gorgeous, but yeah. it's just unbelievable in terms of the, the verticality and the size and the height of the whole thing. So I can really imagine that what you're saying is true, that if you were on it and you spaced out a little bit and it was totally straight, boy, that it would be dangerous. You yes. know, there's something yes. very almost hypnotic about that. Yes. You know? Yes. So there are 154 piers. Wow. And the color for these piers was important uh, to uh, Norman Foster. Huh. Um, they didn't want them to be so light that they blended completely into the color of the sky, which can be milky, of course. Right. They didn't want them to be too dark, to be invisible, uh, you know, to be too visible, sorry, to be too visible in the landscape. 
So they chose a white, uh, kind of an off-white that that looks really attractive. Yeah. And I will put a picture of uh, the, the bridge on the website, but I'm sure you've seen it. One of the major obstacles, like I mentioned earlier, was the wind. The wind can go as high as 200 kilometers per hour wow. in this area, which is 163 That's miles. Lot. That's a yeah. lot. Yeah. And everything was calculated so that the bridge could handle it. And if you don't believe that bridges can be taken down by wind, you should look up uh, the Wikipedia article about the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in the United States, in the state of Washington. Yeah. It collapsed under winds of only 40 miles per hour in 1940. And the photos that were taken right before the collapse, it looks like the, the deck of the bridge is twisting. It looks like a piece of paper. Was that just badly made? It was badly made, yes. They hadn't worked out the... the and it's, to this day, it's the example of what not oh, to really? do with a bridge. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really very interesting. The the Mio Viaduct is built mostly of two materials, reinforced concrete for the for the piers and metal for the deck. Of course there's some, you know, asphalt and all that stuff. The tallest pier is 343 meters high. It's enormous, yeah. That's almost 1200 feet. Right. So, Isn't that taller than the Eiffel Tower? It might be. It's it's, it's in that it's, it's amazing. It's, it's in that neighborhood. Right. You know, I it's mean, that sort of height. You can see it from really far it's away. It's huge. It's you know, huge. It's huge. Uh, it is so high that some days it it's floating above the clouds. Yeah. You know, like the, the Golden Gate of, Bridge does. Right, yeah, the top right. of the piers right. are above the clouds. Right. Uh, when they tested the viaduct before opening in October 20, 2004, they ran a string of 42 semi-trucks, uh, so 1,200 feet of uh, trucks sent to end, and it didn't budge. And they ran some other tests uh, as well. It's it's safe as can be. I mean, it's were these trucks driverless? No, no, they they had uh, they had drivers. Did they, guys no, but have they knew. Did they have parachutes on? <laughs> <laughs> no, they knew it was going to be fine. <laughs> but they have to test it anyway. Yeah, you know, I they know. have to do it. Uh, construction costs were take a guess. Oh boy, I have three billion. No, oh. You're a big spender. I'm a big spender. Yes, it was uh, 394 million euros. Oh, I got the three right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know. Right. Yeah. I have no idea. I, I, forgot, a clue. Zero. I forgot a clue. <laughs> <laughs> so, so 394 million euros That's in 2004 when yeah. it opened. Yeah. And since then, more than 50 million vehicles have driven on it. 50 million. 50 million. How much does it cost to drive it? Yeah. Take a guess. 12 euros? No. More. Eight? More. 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 18? The rest of the freeway is free. 18? Y yes. Actually, no. It's... Okay, so it depends on what size vehicle you're driving. If, uh, if you're on... It, and it's also more in the summer. Oh, really? Yes. That's so sneaky. The cheapest toll is eight euros for a motorcycle in the winter. Okay. And the most expensive is 36 <gasps> for a semi. Oh, for a semi. In okay. the summer. Okay. The, the, the average price for a car is 23. Oh, okay. It's okay. Still, is it both ways or only one? See, well, I think the I toll heard, plaza is on, only I think on one side. Only, I think it's only in one direction. Yeah, I but think, you pay either way. I mean, you pay at the same toll plaza. Are you plaza. sure you pay both ways? Yes, you do. Oh, okay. You do, you do. Oh, that's a lot of money though. Yeah, but in New York, I went on that stinky, tiny little bridge. Uh, what, the George Washington? I don't know which one it was. It was 20 bucks. Really? And it, it, oh, I was so disgusted. I was like, that's a puny bridge. It's not even pretty. And they're making me pay for it. <laughs> well, it was probably built in the 19th century, you know, so. Uh, that's possible. Uh -huh. So that's the other thing. See, right. if they had built it like the French, by now it would be free. It because would be free, obviously. It would have been a concession that expires right. eventually. Anyway, there had been very few incidents uh, on the Mio Viaduct. And what's the most common problem, do you think? Uh, flat tires? Nope. Um, the most common problem... People having to stop the car because they have to go pee? No, it's only two and a half kilometers. Um, Who do you hang up with? I don't know. Uh, fog. No, it's not fog. 
I don't know. It's crazy people stopping to take pictures. Right in the middle. That is the biggest problem. There is no pull off. There's no pull off? Nope. There is an emergency lane. Oh, wow. Okay. But there is nowhere that you can pull off to take a picture. Wow. And the reason why they did that is because they could not possibly accommodate all the people who would want to stop and take a picture. Huh. So it would, they would have had to, bu- to build, you know, the whole length of the thing. And so they decided nobody stops to take pictures. Uh, and the police will, you know, and come just, screaming so come, if you yeah. do stop. So don't stop. It's but a freeway. That's, so that's why they have those things that are on the two ends, uh, just at the beginning and the end of it, so that you can see it but not be on it, and you could take pictures from there. Yes, yes. But uh, And besides, you can take, I mean, the prettiest pictures are from the other side of the valley, right. looking towards the bridge. It is gorgeous. It's the same valley you're looking at. It's just looking at it from the other direction. It, it's um, when, you, when you look at it, it reminds me of something that belongs in a science fiction movie yeah. with very long, yeah. thin things that reach up to the sky. It's very beautiful. Yeah. Really and if is. you look on Google, um, Google Earth... You will see some very nice pictures that mm. they've taken. I bet a drone takes some nice yeah, pictures. Yeah, the drones can take nice pictures. But of course, it's I couldn't fly a drone over that. No, because it's, so it's, it's very, it's, it's high. Yeah, it, well, and it's illegal. I it's can't, illegal. You know, I can't. It's illegal, yeah. Right. So, um, but, um, it, you know, go to Google Maps, Google Earth, look at it. It's just gorgeous. I'll I'll probably put a picture on the website for, for a week or two, and then I'll... I have a huge problem with this website. Guess how many pictures I have on the website on Join Us in France. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm not good. Today, my, num- <laughs> no, my numbers are off. If, number- I say, if, if I say your number again, you're going to tell me, oh, well, my God. Okay, no. there's 100. This is episode 140. Yeah. So how many pictures? Uh, 140 times. I would say three pictures per episode. Oh, so that would make it uh, three, 450. Yeah, 1,600. 1600 1600 this is ridiculous so I, you are ridiculous yes it's amazing it's it's really stupid so what i'm having to do is i'm having to go back and remove a lot of these pictures because the site the site is crawling yeah it's so hard to get any you know to look at anything right. so i'm sorry but from now on folks i'm removing pictures and but i'm going to tell you to google them yourself but but but, but, but do, do for a short time put up one also of the ceramic because it is really beautiful yeah, to yeah, see yeah, you know? yeah. but and then i'll take them you off. know so i I remember when it was opened, because it was before you actually moved back. Yeah. Uh, and so the first couple of years, the people down below in Mio were really unhappy because it had not yet developed so that the people were taking advantage of seeing the viaduct and stopping in Mio, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. And they were saying, oh, yeah, we complained all these years about the traffic, but now all of these businesses in the city center are going to close. And now, of course, it's exactly the opposite. Oh, yeah. Now they're so happy that they have it yeah, because yeah, yeah. people come, they stay. Oh, yeah. Uh, they, in fact, it's, it's helped them develop so that they have music festivals and things like that. Yeah. And so it's been a big boom to the area. Mm-hmm, you know? mm-hmm. and, and the other thing to remember is, you know, don't drive like you're 100 years old when you're on there. Uh, drive a normal speed limit. You know, drive normal because... You might, yeah. Okay, so the the Mio Viaduct was built in stages, and many of them overlapped. So I'm not going to try and give you a construction timeline because, but you know, suffice it to say that they laid the first stone on December 14th, 2001. So late 2001, the viaduct went into operation on December 16th, uh, 2004. Okay. So they were 25 days ahead of schedule. Wow. Yes. They did really great. It took more or less three years to build. Right. You know? That's not so bad. More or less. The planning stages were, um, took much longer because they took 14 years. And uh, uh, so, you know, if you want to see a nice bridge in your neighborhood, folks, <laughs> start planning now because it takes like, right. you know, 17 years to really pull pull together but, but a project maybe, like maybe this. because the head architect was Norman Foster my guess is that by between when the inception was at the, and then the end they developed new materials that made it even better and easier 
or stronger maybe, as a bridge. Maybe, maybe. Because that long, you know, in terms of technology for building these days, that's enough time to it moves along to, yeah. to, to develop new materials, new yeah, new combination things. Although and stuff I don't like know that. if they really would trust materials that they haven't know. tested. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, about a thousand people worked on this con- on the construction of mm-hmm. this uh, viaduct. Not all of them at the same time, obviously. And to make things simpler, they had different teams work on different piers. Hmm. So you were, you know, what I tell you, 154 piers. Right. So you were assigned to pier number 120. And you worked your whole time on that, on that pier. Because they found that trying to get people, you know, different piers were at different stages. Right. And so it was easier to do it that way. The, the, the viaduct was inaugur- inaugurated on December 14th, 2004 by French President Jacques Chirac. They had fireworks, they had military planes, the lot. I, I, like you said, I didn't live in France at the right. time, but I would have gone to see oh, that. It was, the, I watched it on television. Yeah, yeah. It was super. Yeah, yeah. Cause really? I, I didn't move back to France until a year later. So, well, not a year, six months or something. So back to the people in Mio that feared that nobody uh, would ever stop. That wasn't the case at all. There are more people visiting Mio. Uh, more people spend the night. Right. Uh, more people using the restaurants. That when people were forced to sit and in their cars exactly. with terrible traffic jams, the pollution and the noise alone. You know, uh, the inhabitants have. It's such a blessing for right. them because it was, you know, the viaduct just eliminates all of that. The and I, I was just reading that they um, they took some old buildings and they're turning it into this incredible cultural center in the center of Mio. So it's really been a boom to the yeah. area. Yeah. The first year the Mio viaduct was in operation, they had 14% more users than they had anticipated. And the viaduct has been a lot more popular than they ever thought it could be. You know, they knew they were going to... I mean, you estimate the number of cars, right. but, but they they undershot that by a lot. The toll plaza for this viaduct is four kilometers north of the bridge. Uh-huh. The toll plaza has eight lanes of traffic in each direction. So in yes, each direction? Yes. Yes, it's a big... And then it narrows down to two lanes in each, in each direction. direction. Right. Yes. If you, sh- I mean, if you take it and you experience a traffic jam, it's going to be on the toll, not on the bridge. Not on the bridge. They never have a traffic jam on the bridge unless somebody stupid stops to take a picture right, and right. the police has to come. But right. otherwise, the bridge just, it keeps moving and flowing. Mm. When you go, I really recommend that you drive on the viaduct, but also drive under it yes. and uh, you know, d- exactly. look around. Right. Like there is this uh, road, the D forty one A, that will take you really close to yes. the piers. Yeah. Like you can get. That's, yeah, that's you know, where we went. This yeah. is a tiny, tiny little road. Right. You can pull off to the side right. and go touch the piers. I mean, it's it's, it's like looking well, at a giant. You probably you know? can't touch the piers. They probably no. have secured the piers by yeah. now because of terrorism and stuff like that. But when I went years and years ago, you could actually get that. You close. could actually get that close. Yeah. I'm, I'm assuming you can't anymore. The views are gorgeous too. Yeah, I mean, yeah, from yeah. everywhere. Yeah, and then I told you about the Roquefort sur uh, Soulzon, right. which so. Yeah, you have to go to Roquefort sur Soulzon, not the other one. And if you want to stop in Saint Afrique, it's also nearby, and it's very charming. It's a charming little yeah. town, not very uh, big. The other thing I found that would be of interest to me is something called Micropolis. It's a Cité des Insectes. Yeah, this opened this month, February 2017. So I haven't been, obviously. But uh, their website looks really interesting. And if you're with little kids, I think the little kids would enjoy the visit of the Roquefort and this uh, Cité des Insectes. I mean, what kid doesn't like bugs, right? Mm-mm, me. I got- <laughs> Even as a kid, I didn't like bugs. But but you're right. I mean, in the area around there, I mean, there's this place called the Couvertade, which was, uh, it belonged to the... Couvertade. Yeah, it belonged to the... What does it mean? The Knights Templar. Oh. And uh, now it's a f- really interesting place to visit. It it I guess it was a, a fortified monastery. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's really gorgeous. I yeah. mean, this is just all stuff that's in the area, you know, near there. And then there's the Abbey of Sylvanus, 
which is just beautiful, and it's famous for its sacred music festivals every summer. Mm. Uh, and that's very close to Rokefoch. Mm-hmm. And so it's a, it's a really... It, it, I was thinking about that this afternoon before I came over. It's a wonderful area to go and spend a week and visit lots of different things. Uh, it's beautiful. It's very unusual compared to your standard cliche image of what France looks like. Oh, yeah, this is, this is this is genuine. This is the genuine stuff this here. Is, this you know? is France. Like, this is the France of... France of, of yeah, and it's a France that it's still, it's got a rugged quality to yeah, it, you know, yeah. so it's not just pretty civilized parks Do and stuff like that. Do they produce wine in that area? There's a little bit of wine that's produced uh, as you get down towards, as you go towards Montpellier. Well, yeah, Montpellier. Would, in the yeah. Cévennes and, and in yeah. that area. Uh, there's uh, what they call a jumble which is, you know, a kind of, um, I think in English they call it a chaos, but I'm not sure. You know when it's like a huge rock formation produced naturally of like what looks like huge rocks collapsing upon one another? Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's on the road that goes from Mio to Montpellier, but not very far from Mio. Okay. Uh, but there are lots of these sites that are just great to visit, you know, that you can just, they're picturesque and it's... Things yeah. in nature, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. It kind of makes me want to go back there and have a nice vacation there. Well, I think it would be fun to, like you said, to spend a, a little bit of time and really explore the area. Yeah. That's the kind of place where you could hike. Yes. Where you could uh, yes. really enjoy nature. And, you can enjoy nature a lot. And not just museums and stuff. Right. I mean, they probably have, I mean, they do. They have, have a museums. few, but, but basically what's museum-like there is either the old churches, the monasteries, the ancient villages, stuff like that yeah. you know as opposed to like big city stuff and then lots of hiking i think there are a couple of places nearby where you can actually do some uh rafting on the tarn river oh probably yeah, yeah. and uh and just it's just oh it's actually beautiful. I, I actually saw one where you can actually uh river raft underneath the mio bridge uh-huh yeah I, uh, I I remember reading about it quickly and right. then I, I moved on because I was looking for some other information. Yeah. But yes, you can do that. And I remember, um, I don't know if it was the first time or the second time that we went there. It was, a, I think, in March. And coming back, we spent a night near Saint Afrique and then went and visited all this stuff. And uh, coming back on the coast, it started to snow. Ooh, yeah. nice. It was kind of, I mean, it's very I like that kind of, it's kind of dramatic landscape, oh, you know. Oh, it's definitely it's, dramatic it's very landscape. very dramatic landscape, yeah. you yeah. know. It's definitely a nicer thing to do in middle to late spring, summer, and early fall. Winter can be rough there. It's yeah, cold, 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 lots of wind, yeah. but it's just really beautiful. And so this is, this is the eastern edge of Occitanie. Yeah. And going into the Provence right. area, right. you know, it's yeah. right at the edge. Yeah. And when we when we have tours, uh, at some point we'll south. probably uh, yeah offer some tours in the south. I don't know. We'll have to decide. Are we we'll going to decide. go towards Bordeaux right. or towards Aveyron, or do we have oh, to do, do, we, one, do of each, one of each? One of each, because both really have a different type of charm. Absolutely. To them. And this yeah. is a the 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 the. Area uh, that includes all of this is actually uh, the area called Rouergue, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, there are some gorgeous, gorgeous other places to see in this whole area. So you're right. I think we may have to do one going west and then another one going yeah, east. Yeah, because it's just and these much, are yeah. this is an area of France where I would bet even a lot of you listeners who love France don't know you've probably never been. Yeah, because. Really, unless you have family there or you have a reason to go. You or you've know. already been in France so many times you're looking for the one place <laughs> you haven't been. <laughs> but it's really an area that is, you know, it's it's all French people that go there. It's it's really very few tourists or... Some English uh, people. Sm- yeah, probably some English people, yeah. Because there are tours for the Roquefort cheese in English. Yes, yes. So we know that there got to be some of them. All right, Elise, we talked oh. on too long. Oh, this has been fun. <laughs> Good. Where's the roca for cheese, Annie? You know, I don't think I have any in the fridge. Oh, you don't. Because at lunchtime, I actually made um, an endive salad. Yeah. You know, endive salad. So, th- oh, this is a little recipe to finish the right. show. Uh, in France, we eat endive salad with um, roquefort, roquefort and cheese, and walnuts. And walnuts. So, you kind of you, you uh, toast the walnuts and then. Uh, and you serve it with uh, uh, 
mustard vinaigrette is oh. what you It typically... must be tea time. This is making me yeah, hungry. Yeah, you're hungry. <laughs> and at lunchtime, okay, I was preparing a quick lunch very fast, but I did not see any Roquefort in my fridge. This is a problem. When I get the crazy idea that, my, that I, I might be able to lose a pound or two, I stop buying cheese. Yeah, well, unfortunately, that is one of the secrets to losing a pound yeah, or two. Yeah, it never works. It never works. Not for me. No. It, it never works. So I don't know why I've ever stopped buying cheese. So anyway, you know, no, no hog for in my cheese today. Oh, well, we're just going to have to go get some. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Have a good one, and we'll talk to you next week. Au revoir. Au revoir. Thanks for listening to the show. To find out about tours offered by Elise and I, visit addictedtofrance.com. Please subscribe to the Join Us in France email list. It only goes out about once a month, but it is where you'll find out about our most recent episodes, and you'll also be the first to hear about promos we are running on the tours and anything else new we're cooking up. I invite you to look up the Join Us in France closed group on Facebook, a great place for folks who know a ton about France, exchange tips with those who are just starting to look into visiting France. A bientôt! Thank you.